Uh, my name is Katie Coy, and I am the Communications Director at eTech Ohio. I uh, wanted to take the opportunity to thank you for being here with us today at conference. I think I was, I was thinking about it before I came in here, and we're actually halfway. So um, thanks for being here. Uh, we look forward to this all year long, and this year so far has not been a disappointment at all, so we've been thrilled to have you. Um, I'm here today to introduce the State of Tech live podcast. Uh, I was talking to the guys before before we got started, and it turns out that this is their first live event. Uh, so we're really excited that that could be a conference. It's a great compliment to everything we're doing here. So I'm thrilled to have them. Uh, so with no further ado, let me introduce to you Sean Beavers, Eric Kurtz, and Eric Griffith. Welcome to the State of Tech podcast, uh, recorded uh, Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2011. I'm Sean Beavers, and we just want to take a moment to thank eTech, especially Dave Hahn and also Larry Pogue from iTip uh, for putting this together. Uh, we wouldn't be here uh, without them. And um, we want to introduce ourselves if this is your first time tuning into the podcast or uh, if you listened to it before. I'm Sean Beavers. Uh, I'm married. I have two wonderful daughters. Uh, I work for Soida, which is one of the eight ed techs in the state of Ohio. And um, I live in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I'm going to throw it over to my two co-hosts and also my two Valentines, oh <laughs> Eric Kurtz and Eric Griffith. How are you guys doing? Doing great, Sean. Thanks so much. Uh, we weren't going to talk about that. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Eric Kurtz. I am the technology director from uh, North Canton City Schools. And uh, hi to all my North Canton folks out there. See some people. Uh, thanks for being here today. Um, I, uh, likewise, am married with uh, four kids from preschool to pre-med, so I'm kind of stretched out there, uh, and uh, also um, run the uh, Apps User Group website for schools that use Google Apps for education, appsusergroup.org, and uh, just really, really glad to be here. Uh, yes, it is Valentine's Day, so I'm just a little sad about that. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be with my wife today, but I sent her an e-card. So is that, is that okay? It's techie and... Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that'll work. All right. Uh, Eric G., how are you doing? I'm doing great, Eric. Thanks. Uh, I'm Eric Griffith. I'm the director of IT for Mechanicsburg Exempted Village School District. Um, I've been there a uh, little more than a year, and uh, previously I worked at Vandalia Butler City Schools as a uh, senior support technician, and um, yeah, love, uh, love technology. I am uh, married with uh, two children, not at all competing with, with Eric, so... Um, You've got time. I, I do, I do. Um, so, yeah, just happy to be a part of State of Tech. And, again, yeah, thanks to uh, eTech for having us. We appreciate it. Uh, also, I'd like to, uh, to clear up some confusion. I don't know if you can zoom in oh. on this or not. Or maybe pull, we can We can use... pull it up here if you want. Well, actually, I bet they can zoom in. Oh, they can zoom in? So uh, eTech has upgraded my status. I, I don't think it's with pay, but I'm now the director of information. So I have had people all day long asking me where the restroom <laughs> is, where Battelle Hall is. So uh, just to clear some things up a little bit, I, uh, I had this shirt made, and uh, so I don't know if we can uh, <laughs> do that. Yeah, that uh, there we go. I don't work here. Uh, but, yeah, so just, just to clear that up, and, you know, thank you. Uh, I did help a few, a few folks to uh, the restroom and to other halls. But, you know, Very it's nice free of charge. That's part of being e -tech and e-tech uh, enthusiast and state of tech member. So, yes, thank you. All right, well, uh, the State of Tech podcast, if this is your first time listening and, and watching, is a biweekly podcast covering educational technology news and best practices in and around the state of Ohio. And this is a little bit different than what we normally do, so we're not going to be talking about news uh, items today or doing our awesome thing of the week. We're just kind of going to jump into what we love uh, about the eTech uh, conference. And Eric's going to let you know a little bit about how you can actually participate today. Yeah, um, so if you're here in the audience or if uh, you're elsewhere and somehow watching this and uh, want to uh, plug into what we're doing here today, um, what we would do is we would direct you to the State of Tech website um, because we have a, a form that you can fill out there that can give us some information for the podcast today. The State of Tech website is thestateoftech.org. And once you get there, the very first entry you're going to see is, what did you love at the Ohio Education Technology Conference for 2012? 
Now, it's not over yet. We still have another day, so hopefully there's a lot more things for you to love. But since it is Valentine's Day, we were going to go with that theme, what did you love about the conference? And so that's what we're going to be sharing, but we'd like to hear what you guys have to say as well. So if you go there, you'll see that there's a link you can click on that says click here to fill out the form. And it will take you to a very simple Google form where you can just tell us a really neat session that you attended. Or see you on the vendor floor and you just came across this really neat product. Uh, What was something that caught your eye that you're hoping to take back and maybe be able to use when you get back to your district? So if you would do that, after we share our stuff, we're going to take a look at the responses that we've gotten. And we'll be sharing some other stuff that you guys have shared. Now, optionally, you can include your name there. And extra optionally, you can let us know if you would like to come up and join. As you see, we do have a fourth chair uh, empty here. And so um, if there's something uh, that you just want to type and share, that's fine. But if you'd like to actually come up and join us at the end, we'd love to have you up here as well. So let us know. We'll let that form run throughout uh, the uh, time that we're speaking and give you guys a chance to fill that out. Again, that's the stateoftech.org. And speaking of feedback, while we're talking about that, it's worth noting that if you're on the same State of Tech website and just scroll down just a little bit, I think the fourth entry there, there's another survey there called Show Topic Survey. It's really important to us that the topics we cover are things that people care about. We've done, what have we done? Google Apps for Education. Interactive interactive, whiteboards. Interactive whiteboards. BYOT. BYOT, tablets, uh, tech support. uh, Google Apps. Tech and math. We try to find things that we think people are going to care about because it's things we care about, but we want to know. And so right now, there is a uh, link there. It's about the fourth uh, article down on the State of Tech website called Show Topic Survey. If you would click that as well when you get a chance, that would be fantastic. What it does is it takes you through about, I don't know, 12 or 15 or so different suggestions that we're thinking about that would be some great upcoming show topics. And you can say whether you're not interested, if it would be okay, or if you would love to see that topic. We've been getting some great feedback on the survey. There's also a box where you can suggest your own topics there. And so we would love for you guys to do that to help us have a better idea about upcoming shows, what topics we should focus on. All right. I got to look through uh, some of the topics, and I was surprised to see uh, beard health and maintenance uh, was actually one of the topics. Yeah, I... (laughs) I'm not surprised. Um, I, 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 well, actually, we have had some shows where it's been very beard heavy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. TJ, where are you at, TJ? Nick, yeah, yeah, see? We are, we Re- are a minority. Respect so. the beard. Yes, respect the beard. I hope to grow one one day. That's, I've got it on the calendar, but uh, not there yet. So. I believe in you. All, All right, right, well, I think we're going to jump into our, our main topic today, which is things that we loved about the eTech. And like Eric said, there are going to be many more sessions over the rest of today and uh, on Wednesday, um, but I thought I would share one of the ones that I went to. I went and saw a session. It was called Beyond Paperless by Ryan Collins was a presenter. And, you know, talking about uh, what a paperless classroom is or, you know, thinking about going paperless. And it wasn't really, you know, I kind of had this preconception that was going to be about, you know, turning things in electronically through Google Docs, which, you know, of course you can do. um, But, you know, he did make a point of saying it's not taking your school forms and just turning those into PDFs and and putting them on your website. You know, it has to go beyond that. Um, and, And thinking about you know, how students are turning in work, you know, whether that's using something like Prezi or using audio clips, um, and, and really what does good student work look like? You know, can they write just a paragraph or just a few words, and, and is that sufficient uh, for the assignment? So what do you guys think about that? Uh, paperless is a big topic in our district right now. Um, I know I've said it many times on the show, you know, it's, um, we're a, a financially challenged district right now. I think everybody is. I think around Ohio, uh, we've got tight budgets everywhere. And so that's one of our big moves right now is what can we do to reduce our paper consumption? What can we do? I mean, because that's, you know, paper, it's, it's, it's ink, it's, it's electricity, it's, it's all of that. Um, so there is a big move for that. And so we are trying to... Um, Help people rethink how things are done. And you're right, it's not just a matter of saying, I'm going to take this, turn it into a PDF, and put it online. But are there other ways that people can submit this information? And I think it's going to open up a lot of other stuff um, in in a curricular sense, as far as being able to get students to do more work online, in the cloud, collaborating together, um, not just turning in an assignment electronically, but collaborating together electronically. I periodically just shut off our copiers, so, I mean, I do my part, so. Well, ours don't work this year <laughs> very well, so <laughs> they shut themselves off, and uh, we keep promising, no, this is not a master plan. We're not doing this on purpose. They really aren't working, uh, but, yeah, that's, uh, I think you're right. You know, you have to rethink how these things are being done, not just say, let's make everything digital, but 
you know, it's the idea of transforming. It's the same thing with everything we say in education. Don't just do what you've always done digitally. Say, what can we do different with technology? How can we transform what we're doing and get into those higher thinking skills and get into more interaction with, with others? And I think, you know, another important point that he brought up was, you know, paper's been around forever. I mean, literally forever. You know, since we had stone tablets and uh, papyrus, I'm not sure, Ryan, if I'm saying that right, he can, he can let me know. But, um, you know, that we need to think outside just the 8.5 by 11 piece of paper because it's static, it doesn't change. You know, again, great example is Prezi, how that you can change your presentation and zoom in into different sections. And, uh, you know, and especially now with the proliferation of mobile devices, iPads and iPod Touches and Android tablets, you know, why not? Excellent. Well, speaking of paperless, actually, that does move nicely into the first thing I wanted to talk about, about something neat that I saw. Um, went to a session. Cheat here and take a look at my session notes. There we go. Uh, I went to a session yesterday by um, Michael Pennington from Chardon and Garth Holman from Beechwood. Um, if you get a chance to, to you know, check out the uh, show notes, we'll have links to pretty much everything that we're sharing here today. So we'll try to link in the websites that we're showing here. Um, these guys teach um, seventh grade, and it's, uh, it's, it's a social studies uh, class in two different school districts. And their idea was to have the students create the textbook. Uh, I may not have started exactly that way, but over the last six years, that's what it's developed into. So you talk about paperless. Well, they don't have a textbook in their class anymore. There is not a seventh grade social studies textbook these kids get. They do not have one, okay? Um, what they've done is they have used wiki spaces, but any tool would certainly be fine. And all that the uh, teachers did was to create the side here on the left where you see the topics. They made, uh, they, they, they took the standards basically and, and made the topics. The students then created the content. The students went out and researched. The students, you know, watched this and read that and did web quests or whatever to learn the material, and the students started creating this. Now, it started off really small, but over six years it has grown and grown and grown and grown that now the students are learning from what they've been creating. So what started off as something that was just this project to sort of supplement the class, it has now become one of the, you know, one of the instructional tools for the class. Now, they, they, they clearly say it's, it's not meant to just be a textbook. It is meant to be a learning experience. And I think that's really true because if a student's going to take the time to create a page on a topic, they've got to know that material. But they're also revising, and they're changing, and they're updating, and they're fixing, and year after year after year they do that. I'll give you a quick example here. Let's say we go to the Middle Ages. Maybe. Maybe. Well, we are uh, with the wireless. Yes, this is very Middle Ages. Uh, and I'll just pick something at random. I'll choose the uh, Spanish Inquisition. You, you probably didn't expect me to choose that, did no, you? No one expects Nobody that. Nobody expects that. Totally random. Come on, that was a good one. Okay. Um, but, and so what you've got here is you've got um, student-created content where they have they found pictures, all Creative Commons stuff. Okay? And they have to understand. They have to learn about that. All the text the students have typed up. And then you've got things that they've put in, like their own cartoons they've drawn. Here's a podcast that the students have made, so an audio recording. There's videos the kids have made. There's charts and graphs they've made, because sometimes what they found wasn't Creative Commons. It wasn't something they could use, so they needed to make their own. And so over time, they have been creating their own online textbook. And I think that's just a really neat idea when you hear about what Apple's doing with, uh, with, the, with, with their iBooks. iBooks author, yeah. Okay. Um, it's really opened up this topic a lot, and I think it would warrant a show at some point just to really get deep Definitely. into this sort of yep. stuff. Um, but here's a situation where they've taken it in on their own that the students are becoming the teachers. They're creating their own textbook. Um, the last thing I'll say on that is that then just today I was on the vendor floor, and I was chatting and came across some folks over there from CK12. Now, CK12 is a nonprofit organization, no cost whatsoever. Their whole focus is to create free public domain, creative commons, whatever you want to say, free uh, electronic textbooks that schools can download and modify themselves. Not only can you download the content, but you get an author piece of software where you can modify and change it yourself. Right now, it's math and science. It's 6 through 12, but they want to keep expanding and growing with it. And, I mean, it's totally free. There are no strings attached at all. You just go, you download it, you have it, you modify it. 
One of the schools that is partnering with them is Open High School out in, in Utah. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they are running a high school that is, again, paperless and is not using textbooks. And so all of this, I think, is really exciting, the idea of what, you know, what should a textbook be? I think they need to go away. I think it needs to be something cloud-based. It needs to be... Uh, you know, something that is hyperlinked, something that is multimedia, something that is ever-changing, something, something that is not static, and something that is free, something that is open, open educational resources that we all are collaborating on. And these folks, from 7th grade kids to uh, CK12 as, a, as this organization and Open High School, they're all attacking this. And I was just blown away by seeing that here this year. And it makes me really think a lot about the flipped classroom and what that means, you know, having the students create their own content rather than the teacher just always being that dispenser of knowledge and, um, you know. And they do a lot of flipping this year um, uh, with, the, uh, with the, student, the seventh grade students. That has now actually become part of this process as they continue to develop it, and they will continue to develop it. Excellent. Great. All right. Speaking of uh, flipping out of the classroom and onto wireless, um, how many people have wireless in their school buildings right now, just by show of hands? Okay, that was kind of silly because uh, the light's coming down. I cannot see anybody in the audience. So I'm going to assume a large majority of you have them. Hopefully, uh, you've chosen um, this vendor, which I spent a little bit of time with uh, today and yesterday, uh, Meraki. Has anybody heard of Meraki? Great. Yes, that's all four of you. Great. Uh, Meraki is, is an amazing um, cloud-based router or cloud-based, uh, what, cloud-based managed solution? Sure. Yep. Sure. where they do access points, uh, routers, and now security and switching. So it's a pretty neat technology. Um, it's something that I bought into and, and Eric Kurtz bought into uh, more than a year ago, maybe? Yep, yep, we've been using it. Yep, uh, we have 20, 20 or so access points uh, in our school district as well as a router. And what this allows us to do is manage and you know, sort of benchmark you know, what, what content our students and staff are actually looking at as well as provide a safe and secure environment for them. Um, the most amazing thing that I just uh, was reminded of by uh, Brian Shaw, who I don't believe is here today, but um, it's, uh, the, the technology that they have is called the Meraki Systems Manager. And what it is, it's a free, as long as you own a, a Meraki device, it's a free device, web-based device, that you can dis deploy across your network. So it will allow you, it will inventory your systems, it will allow you to install and uninstall software, but the neatest thing is you can control iPads with it. So there's, and, and controls, uh, kind of a different word here, how about manage uh, is, the, is the word I'd rather use. Um, I can push applications to it, I can tell what's installed on the iPad, I can tell uh, you know, how much information that person is downloading and looking at, so it's a really impressive software um, application that comes with uh, Meraki, and it's something that uh, you don't really have to buy. What's the uh, what's the software application that we talked about a few minutes ago? It was Jamf. Jamf and the Casper Suite. Casper Suite. You know they have the technology to be able to push and modify iOS apps with this. And honest to gosh, if you have a Meraki device, you're set. So I mean, it's really impressive. I've I uh, redeployed it in my network and have found uh, some software that I didn't realize teachers have installed already, and I've been able to. Just with one click, just remove that without ever going to the classroom. The same with the iOS device. Uh, I can push out applications right on there. So, I mean, it's, it's starting to make a BYOT solution really manageable. So, Yeah, and, and thanks to you. you. You told me about that as well, and we were chatting with some Meraki folks here at the conference. And uh, so we, likewise, uh, rolled it out on our Meraki network. Didn't even realize it was there. It had been uh, at first thought to have been a, a pay solution, but they made it free. Yep. They just said, "This, if you own Meraki, you're going to have this. And so, yeah, it's a piece of cake. You turn it on, and basically it just starts scouring your network, and it finds all your devices and tells you how big the hard drive is and the RAM and the processor yep. and the name and who's, been, who's logged in and how long it's been logged in. Every piece of software on it, you can do remote connections to it. You can do screenshots. You can send command line uh, uh, you know, options to it to turn them off. Uh, uh, if people People leave their computers on over the weekend. See yep. what's on, turn them off, boom, shut yep. them down. You can you know, install all, software, down. uninstall software. Oh, my goodness, what right. an amazing management and We've tool. had enough of the Meraki Love Fest. That's enough. <laughs> well, the one thing that uh, I've, I've enjoyed <laughs> testing over the past couple of days is you can actually push out a message over it. So we've, you can. Had, we've had some kids that tend to get around the proxy a little bit and do a little Facebooking. So just to see a message appear right on their desktop that says, I'm watching you. You know, it creeps them out a little bit. Not to say that Meraki is all about creeping people out, but the fact that you have the ability 
to send out a message. It could be, hey, you know, there's a fire drill. You need to stop what you're doing. You know, there's a lot of different applications. Uh, but right now, I've just been using the Big Brother feature of it. So yeah. You know, the big question is, will it blend? That's what I want to know. Will it blend? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a little too pricey for me to pull it off the uh, rack and blend one of those things. But yeah. Yeah. anyway. All right. Well, very good. All right. Uh, well, back to me. Uh, another great session I saw yesterday was on the gamification of, of the classroom, and it was presented by David Grimes. And um, again, kind of thinking about uh, ways that we can take elements from massive multiplayer online games like uh, WoW and uh, Guild Wars, uh, EverQuest. Anybody play EverQuest, Guild Wars, World of Warcraft? Okay, maybe nobody wants to admit it. All right, all right. I play Guild Wars. Anyway, um, you know, so thinking about some of the elements from those games, for example, you know, if you take a look at your grading scale, you know, students can earn XP for different grades. So I might earn, you know, 250 XP uh, for an A or maybe, you know, 150 XP for a B. And then, you know, maybe have a poster in front of the classroom with the student's avatar so they can track how much XP they have. And um, I, I thought that was really interesting, you know, thinking about tests and quizzes sort of as bosses and, you know, students crafting their skills, you know, if they're working on uh, an activity. And uh, one of the websites that he mentioned was this Common Deeds website, uh, which is up there behind us, where you can actually go and create custom badges for your students so they can create accounts, they can earn XP, you know, once they achieve that badge. Um, and then, you know, they can log in, they can see how much experience they have, what badges they've earned, and then also... Uh, see how much they need to get to the next level. So, you know, maybe I'm a level 11, I need 14 more points to level up. So I really thought that was uh, interesting and, and also, uh, you know, might work. I mean, not every classroom is going to do that, but um, Eric, you said your daughter has kind of run into that in college. They've talked about that, correct? Yeah, yeah. My daughter's at Bowling Green, and she, she's an avid gamer. Yeah, I mean, she and I, World of Warcraft, EverQuest before that, Toontown before that, Disney's to Toontown. That was a, Any Di Diablo? That's the... Uh, no. Oh, man. But, right. you know, uh, so uh, she's an avid gamer, j just like I am. And um, she, so she's at Bowling Green, um, and she plugged into a, um, like a, um, a learning group that had several professors, uh, mostly graduate students, and then two of the undergrads, her and, and one other student. Um, and it was to focus on um, how can the concepts of gaming be used in education, not how can games be used in education, which they can be. I mean, absolutely. There, you know, there's a way to make Angry Birds, you know, oh, flight path or whatever, parabola, something. But no, that's not what they're saying. They're saying the idea of why does a kid sit there and play this game over and over and over and over again where they're not, not, not getting a tangible reward, they're not getting paid. How, how can they just pour so much energy into that? And that motivation, I mean, we try to get motivation like that out of kids all the time. It's and, about and the better armor. And it's, it's the better yeah. armor. It's, it's, and what is it that drives them? So look at those ideas of game motivation and game rewards and, and game involvement and engagement. How can that apply to education? So that's what she has spent uh, the last year in this, in this group uh, looking at, and they actually have a, a presentation they've created on it, and a paper they've written, and all this stuff about how that could apply into education. And I'm really excited to see it once she c can make it available, because I, I want to see you know what they've come up with from that. But you're right; I think that we do need to think about that. You know, how do we motivate our students? Well, find out what's already motivating them. Let's study that and see how it might be able to apply. So this is awesome that that, that they're providing at least one option here through CommonDeeds.com. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Um, well, I guess pop over to me then for uh, my next thing. And uh, it's, you know, no surprise, I am a fan of the IPVO uh, hardware. Heard. You've, you've heard, uh, if you watched our gadget show, I think that's when I, I talked about an IPVO camera at that time that was the IPVO um, point to view. Mm -hmm. um, it's a document camera. And I, I went on about why I really liked that. Uh, it, it did everything that we needed at a really, really great price. So check that podcast if you want to get more information on that specific gadget. Turns out I'm here on the vendor floor. I see IPVO. They're here. They have a new document camera called the Ziggy. Uh, I'm guessing maybe because it kind of shaped like a Z or something like no that. Perhaps. No relation to Ziggy Stardust, right? I just... I, I'm pretty sure and probably not the little cartoon strip where, you know, everything <clears throat> is cute. All right, so here we go. This is the Ziggy, and it's, uh, it's very similar to the point of view. It's not, I would not call this like an update. I would call it an alternative. It serves its purpose 
a little bit differently than the point to view did. Uh, so, real quick, what's the same about these? Well, first of all, um, they're, they're low price. Uh, this is uh, $89, the point of view is 69 So compared to document cameras, which many times can run you 300 400 and up, these are very affordable options for document cameras. What else is the same? The camera. It's a 1600 by 1200 resolution camera. Let me go ahead and pull this up on the screen here, and you want to throw, here we'll throw our Stata Tech thing down there. There we go. Um, and so, might have a little too much light, but I can, uh, I can, I can fix that here in a second. Um, uh, but so it's, it's got a 1600 by 1200 camera, um, which is very good resolution. Uh, you need kids to be able to read. If you're putting stuff down there, if you're using a document camera in class and you're putting a book down there to share with the kids, the, the letters, pictures you can get away with. The letters, if you can't see the letters, if it's a blur, that is not going to work with your students who are trying to teach them to read, okay? And so it has to have a good camera, and it does have a good camera. Another thing um, that um, is the same about it is the software. The point of view software that I'm using here up on the screen is the same. It allows you to do things like zoom in, and it allows you to change the mirroring, change the resolution, change the exposure so I can make it brighter or less bright. Um, I can also turn a timer on to take a picture after three seconds or ten seconds. The software is the same. That, that itself has not changed. And it allows me to take pictures. So I can uh, take a snapshot, press the enter key, and take a snapshot, and that goes into my, into my pictures folder there, and I have that picture. Um, so what's different? What makes this one different than the other? A couple of things. Um, this particular model has a much heavier base. The other one's very good as well, but this is a much heavier base, and that allows them to make it a longer arm. And so this does have, I'm not sure the exact size, but this is a longer arm. So for people who needed to be able to uh, you know, move this much higher or have more mobility with it, this does address that issue. Um, this also has a, um, a camera head that does not come off. Now, that could be a pro or a con. The other one you could pop off and move around. This one's not going to pop off. It's going to stay right where it's at. You can twist it. That's fine, but it's not going to pop off. It also has a little, few more adjustments. I can adjust the exposure right on here ra right. rather than going to the software to do it. But one of the other fun things it has is this um, light filter, I guess I, I would call it. Sometimes they say what you have, like with an iPad, is you might get some glare off the screen. And so what this does is it allows you to slip this on. And let's see if I can do this properly here. It allows you to slip this on. We'll lose our picture for a second while I'm slipping it on. There we you go. practiced prior, didn't you? There we go. And what it does is basically this little shield here now is going to block out a lot of the ambient light. Now, we've got some really bright lights coming in from here, so <laughs> I'm not expecting it to, to catch those. But normally in a classroom, the light is coming down. It's going to help shield that so just more of the ambient light, not the direct light, is going to be on there. And it takes off the glare of something like, like an iPad. So what they've said is, why would you choose one versus the other? Typically, science teachers are liking the older model, the, the uh, point of view, because it gives them the flexibility to pop the camera off, place it next to things, move it around. They're finding math teachers and English teachers are preferring this a little bit more for the longer arm and the light filter and things like that. So it kind of depends on who you are and uh, what, you know, what your need is for it, but they're both very affordable, excellent document cameras. And if you do go with the other one, the point to view, uh, there's a new accessory coming out, so I don't have it yet, uh, but it's coming out soon. They have a microscope adapter that you can put on it in order to do 25 times magnification, another good thing for the science folks. So they tend to be diverging, I think, a little bit in two directions with who they're supporting. But again, you find what works best for you and still a really good price for a document camera. And I think it would be great for people who have iPad 1s, like you said, to, if you want to put your iPad underneath there, you can reduce the glare with that filter and yes. uh, show it to your class. And what, while we're here, we might as well say, uh, IPVO, thank you for allowing us to borrow this stand today. It's a, uh, another one of their devices. It's a, an iPad stand. They've got the short one and the tall one. So if you're presenting, uh, they're allowing us to borrow that for our presentation today. Anything else? Uh, no? Yeah. No. Good. Good. All, All right. right. Well, um, I think at this time, uh, we'll probably be starting to transition from what we saw here at eTech, the, the best of the stuff, to what other people saw at eTech. And so uh, I do know we have at least one person 
who um, said that they wanted to come up for sure, and that is T.J. Houston. So I'm going to give him just a little moment to start preparing himself to come join us. Oh, wow, he's, he's up and running. Um, so, T.J., why don't you come up and join us? Uh, you, there's some stairs over there if you want to come around there. Just for um, the stairs. That's my roll. And, uh, and then um, while T.J. is going to be sharing here in just a moment, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up our... Uh, um, our responses, and so good. Sure. We've got we've got that off. Excellent, fantastic. And we'll see what other people might have shared. TJ, why don't you tell us what's yeah. going on? So um, I don't know. Can you hear me? Okay, not okay. Do you mean to hold it? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I recently, um, when I was at a conference last year, actually this conference, I noticed that the back channel was very important. The Twitter conversations and things like that. A um, lot of resources shared, um, and I saw people that were using it, and they were trying to minimize, and they had all these different systems to try to make it work, and it just wasn't comfortable. Um, at least for me, it would never be comfortable to try to make everything fit. So what we did was we developed an iPad app that does just that. Um, I don't know if you can see. Um, it's called Soapbox, and you can get it on the App Store. Uh, but what you do is simply enter in your presentation URL. So it can be any web content. Um, it can be a Google presentation. Um, anything that runs on the iPad natively in the browser, you're able to showcase. And then you put in your hashtag. So let, we'll follow, we'll type in OETC12. And providing we have good internet access. And you'll see that on the right hand side, um, you'll, our social media feed starting to come in. Um, and wait for it, wait for it. There we go. And on the left-hand side, you'll see where your Google, I have a Google presentation loaded. Um, and we can follow the conversations as we're going along. Um, or if it is too much of a distraction, we can just hide it over there. Um, so again, it's called Soapbox. Um, I'll be hanging around if you have any questions or anything like that. But that's all. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Excellent DJ. app. Fantastic. Thanks, DJ. All right. Um, well, I'm uh, taking a look here at some of the stuff that uh, got shared with us. And... Um, it looks like, uh, if I'm not mistaken here, Jason Knoll, who I believe is with us here, said he had something he wanted to share. Uh, so I'll give Jason a moment to prep himself and come on up. All right, come on up. Um. Uh, I, there was a lot of actually good stuff here this year. So, um, But I, I went to several different presentations, one by Apple and then some other ones. And the, the last one I went to was done by uh, New Albany Schools. Um, it was their Spark program. It was actually really interesting from a technology standpoint. Um, I'm on the backside stuff because I'm a consultant in education and you know working with teams and doing support for the teachers and the break fix stuff. The Spark program that these guys had actually took their curriculum coordinators and this extra set of team to the curriculum coordinators or the ed tech people would go in and then train the teachers on something and help integrate it in the classroom. But when they left, it was usually then to the break fix guys to support that. So you're running into the classroom trying to help out, you know, the smart board's not working, they don't know how to plug it in. And that was taking away from them being able to do real support stuff, I guess you can call it. Um, and they built this team called Spark, which then is another group of people that work with the coordinators, but they come in afterward to help those teachers continue to integrate the technology into the classroom. They had used some uh, clever ways to fund these people. They are like a part-time team, and they're using some state funds to um, pay their salary so it's not coming out of the school. So, and the, the technology guy that um, does the back-end services says their ticket count, which normally was sitting at 150 to 200 tickets, has dropped down to like 20 tickets because now they're not having to go in the classroom and having, having to fix all the, the, the little things that the teachers need, like the break-fix stuff. The Spark team is doing that and helping those teachers use the iPad in the classroom after the curriculum coordinator, kind of ed, tech ed person has left. So I thought that was a really good presentation from New Albany Schools, and it was really cool to see that. I'd like to see it put in some of my schools that I support. So Great. All right. Thanks, Jason. Thanks. Well, right. excellent. Um, I do see we have another one here, but I don't know this person. I'm not sure uh, if they're with us or not, but Dinah Hunt had suggested something and said she'd be willing to join us on stage. Is Dinah here? If not, that's okay. This one came in earlier before the session, so it might have been somebody who was not able to join us. Uh, she was saying that she really liked a session called In Plain English, You Can Do It. Um, it's a, uh, a presentation by Karen Long and Roger O. Oh, she said. 
Um, and she said that they made their own common craft style videos and the cross-curricular possibilities were endless and she can't wait to try one on her own. So yeah, awesome. that'll be one. I'll look it up in the guidebook and try to link that into the show notes as well so people can take a look at that if they want to see that. Um, let's see, here's a, another one somebody shared of something they liked. He said, I've been looking for an LMS, so a learning management system, that is cloud-based and feels like a social network and have, some, and have some interest in the Schoolology program. While it does have some costs involved, the design, layout, feel, ease of use, collaboration, etc., I feel will be an easy hook for our students and hopefully the same for our staff. We have Moodle in-house, but it hasn't become the solution we were hoping for. So we've got a school there who's taking a look at an LMS, and they're saying they were impressed by Schoolology. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think LMS is a big topic. Uh, when we were walking around, we saw quite a few out there. Um, I guess for what it's worth, um, Eric, you and I both, we ran across It's Learning. It's is, Learning. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. Do you want to mention anything about that one? Uh, yeah, it was a nice, uh, nice presentation there, and the, the thing that... Uh, really sparked my interest was actually the cost. You know, most um, learning management systems, they want to know uh, or they want to charge you by the, you know, per student, you know, some sort of uh, licensing per student fee. But currently, most likely for a limited amount of time, they have a, you know, one price that you can just purchase. And I think it was around $1,000 uh, per building. Okay. Yep. It was very, uh, very nice. Uh, it, it reminded me of Moodle, but a little bit more... Uh, friendly, um, and uh, the, the fact that they had integration with Google and um, you know a lot of other um, systems that you could uh, export right out to gradebook programs and things like that. So it was pretty impressive, and it was it's learning, and uh, they're at the in the vendor booth. I don't recall which one, but I know Meraki is booth uh, 1041. Oh, okay, okay, okay. You know, jump back on uh, that train. But no, yeah, I, I was chatting with them too. Um, actually, I came across it's learning not because of them being on the vendor floor, but a, a presentation. I was at yeah. a, a paperless presentation yesterday. It was really more of a, an, an LMS presentation, and that just happened to be the LMS that they were using. And the thing that I guess caught my eye about it, and again, I don't really know too much about it, but I was impressed enough that I think it is worth mentioning. Um, when teachers log in to its learning, they all see the same interface. It doesn't matter if you teach kindergarten or, you know, AP stats. You see the same interface. So you can bring all of your staff in and teach them and not have to worry about what level they're at as far as what they teach. They're going to see the same interface. But the kids don't see the same front end. If you say this is a high school course, a middle school course, an elementary course, it reskins the front end that the students see so that for the high school, it looks, you know, like a very professional, very clean, very compact website. Mm -hmm. Go to the middle school, things spread out a little bit more, colors get a little brighter, gets a little bit cooler. Go to elementary, things spread out much farther. The font gets much bigger. Colors are much more primary. Very easy for a child to navigate. So without you having to do anything and worry about that, it does make those changes. Uh, if you haven't heard about its learning, I think it's because they're really new to hear. They started in... Norway. They're from Oslo. Uh, it, would be, it came out of a graduate, two graduate students mm -hmm. wanted an alternative to Blackboard and made one. And it developed this. Now they're coming over here to the States. So uh, LMS stuff, I hope we may have a, a well, show on, a topic. on that as well. I'd like to talk about Open Class from Pearson that Google has. There's a lot of good stuff. So hopefully we'll see some more of those. As well as Moodle. I happen to know a presenter who actually got me interested in Moodle. And uh, I won't mention him because he'll, you know, get all big-headed and whatnot. So, uh, but yeah, Moodle as well, uh, you know, probably in that. In Fantastic. A yeah. um, couple more comments here. Uh, some of these were just general comments, and that's fine. They weren't specific products. Um, but uh, Becky mentioned that um, real teachers really excited about how they have transformed their classrooms using not thousands of dollars of equipment, but instead time and commitment to making school a better place to be for our students and it's paying off. Inspirational, she says. So, I mean, I think that's fantastic, and I, I have to agree with that. You know, the best sessions typically are just regular folks who are doing this stuff day in and day out. I mean, that's really the whole point of the eTech conference to me. Yes, I love meeting the vendors. That's fantastic. It's a great chance just to get them all in one place. And well, What's this? How do you compare this? What's that? And it's great to have people like um, Jaime Kassop come in. Love Jaime. Fantastic. You know, and, you know, great presentation. That's fantastic. But the, I think the, the, the meat of a presentation like this is 
us. It's folks. It's, it's teachers. It's, it's ed tech folks. It's librarians. It's principals. It's, it's um, you know, specialists. It's special ed folks. It's all these people coming together just sharing, here's what I've done in my classroom. And it is very inspiring. And I really do appreciate the fact that we have this opportunity to get together like this. I think it's extremely positive, you know, that you can see that other people are being successful with these different tools. And like you said, ones that are no cost or you know, zero cost or, mm -hmm. you know, and that they're implementing in their classroom. And, and it needs to be low cost yeah. and zero cost. We don't have a lot of choice in schools. We have to think that way because we don't have the budgets to do those sort of things. Yep. That's fantastic. And I know Eric's not going to mention this because it's tooting his own <laughs> horn, but uh, someone submitted said that Eric's Google Apps, Apps session yesterday was a nice session to move your mouse to introduce uh, to those not currently using the apps, uh, meaning the Google apps uh, and forms. Uh, and you know what? I attended his session as well, and it was a packed house. I mean, The just, fire department was there. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they actually made me leave. Um, so I, I don't know. I was making it. Well, office. you were very loud. I, yeah, I was. Both, <laughs> very inappropriate. Both Brian Poole and I were, were throwing things. Um, but yes, it was, uh, it was a yes. great presentation. And um, yeah, just a lot of information about Google Forms that, you know, uh, there's there's the you know how to use Google Forms just the intro but then Eric went above and beyond and then gave examples of how his district uses Google Forms and uh, the one that really struck uh, stood out to me was your kindergarten registration True. even though when you started uh, and and I'll let Eric say this because you've probably said it about 15 times um, you can do it more eloquently than I but um, you, he had a kindergarten registration right so you made a Google Form that's mm -hmm. kindergarten registration. And then so next year, they, they didn't really want it in Google Form, but... Well, yeah, what happened was we had a, a bit, bit of a change in our administration at the building. Uh, no problem at all. Fantastic person to another fantastic person. But it was, it was, it was a different you know, idea for right. how they wanted to handle the registration. So, yes, this year we did not do kindergarten registration with a Google Form, but we still used a Google Form because what they said was this. We want to provide the registration packets as a PDF for now, online, okay, but we want to make sure that if somebody downloads it, we know who they were. We want to know their name, their email address, their contact information, because we want to follow up with them. Right. And, I, and of course, they ask me that. And I go, well, we can't do that. Then I go, hmm. I mean, we all do that, don't we? We're yeah, like, just a little. Hang on, let me think. Mm. And you, so you start thinking, I go, how about this? And so we created a Google form that says, give me your name, give me your address, give me uh, what you know, um, your 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 email address, your phone number, whatever. And once they click submit, it then takes them to normally what is the end of the form, which is just, thank you for submitting this. Well, in Google Forms, you can edit that, okay? You can change what that confirmation notice is. And so I, I, now it says, thank you for submitting this. Below is the link to the registration. Right. And I simply just put in the HTML link, you know, the URL, right to the PDF in the confirmation. And so they fill in their information, they click submit, and now they get the link to the form. Yep. I never thought even to do that. So it's yep. a whole new way to use Google Forms. And yep, absolutely. We've got a great showing of Google here this year. Uh, so many good sessions, and I really appreciate so many people sharing those things. We're seeing a great, great growth in the free Google Apps resources. So uh, thanks for reading that. I appreciate that. I tried to type it as fast as I could, so I, <laughs> I hoped you'd see it. Um, uh, just a couple minutes left here. Um, here's another general one. Sally says, I loved the web 2.0 ideas for students and teachers with so much out there on the web. It is great to have recommendations on, um, for, us, for us to use or what to avoid. Uh, another session that got plugged real quick here, the two guys from Perry Local, uh, plus free tools. That was the name, I think, uh, uh, two, two guys and free tools was the name of session. An awesome communication system session. Uh, it was a good overall presentation to help a school district do a better job of communicating. This is the one where they um, send out a message one time and it goes to like everything. It goes to Twitter and Facebook and somehow YouTube's tied in and it goes to their website and, and they've set this all up. So I'll try to find the link for that one as well and put that on. I, I did not attend it, but I did read about that and I thought that was great. Um, and then um, Brian mentions Moodle Workshop was great. Learned some new features I didn't know about. Creating eBooks for all devices. Um, and then Deb mentions sports broadcasting made easy for schools. I guess oakhills.localsportsradio.com hmm. had a session about sports broadcasting for schools. So was not aware of that one. Um, Andy mentions integrating iOS products into schools and managing those devices in an efficient manner. And Eric mentioned uh, from the keynote today, 
He liked the quote, piracy is, uh, yeah, piracy is the price we pay for living in a free society. In other words, ideas were meant to be free. So uh, I think I saw most of those there. So we really appreciate people taking the time to share what they thought was great, what they loved uh, here on Valentine's Day at the uh, Ohio Technology Education Conference. Um, but as we wrap things up, any uh, final words before Eric G. tells people how to stay in touch with us? Just that, again, you know, we have that survey on our, on our website, so please do, um, you know, fill it out so we can pick our, our next couple of topics for the state of tech. And uh, I'll throw it over to Eric G., and he can tell you how to get in touch with us. Great, yes. As always at the state of tech, we have uh, several ways to keep in contact with us. Um, one is through Google Voice. Uh, our Google Voice number is 513-318-TECH. Um, you can follow us at Twitter, at The State of Tech. We have a Gmail account. It's thestateoftech at gmail.com. We have our website. It's thestateoftech.org. And our Google Plus account now. Mm, yes. Yep. So, yep, lots of different ways for us to, you know, <laughs> Or you can show up at Eric's house. Yeah. I, you know, I like to, uh, you know, appear everywhere, uh, variously, various places on the Internet. So, anyway, this has been The State of Tech, and we hope to see you again in another few weeks for another State of Tech. Thanks. Thanks so much.